Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Scales are little insects that suck the life out of your plants. Today we're going to talk about the different kinds. Also, we've got lots of questions about trees. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Amy Dismukes. Amy is a TSU nursery specialist, and arborist Wes Hopper will be joining me later. All right, Amy. Let's talk about scales, specifically the difference between soft scales and hard scales. Hey, hey. make your skin crawl. First off, <laughs> right. um, this is one of my favorite programs to give, by the Good. way, because Good. by the time I'm finished, everybody in the <laughs> audience is doing this. Uh. <laughs> or either this. They're terrified. And I think I've said something really horrible. <laughs> but um, yes, so scale insects. Scale are most people don't know what scale are, mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. They're teeny tiny. Um, they're very inconspicuous. Yes. They're probably one of the most destructive insects in the landscape because of that. But there are soft scales and there are hard scales. Okay. Soft scales are different in that, I guess I'll try to say this, soft scales they both feed on sap. They're right. phloem feeders is what we call them, along with many other insects like aphids mm -hmm. and mealybugs. But there's a difference. Soft scale actually emit honeydew, right. just like aphids do, right. whereas the hard scale don't. That actually makes them much more difficult to control That's right. because they feed a little bit differently. So, and saying that, we'll go ahead and jump into that if it's okay. Mm -hmm. These guys right here, these euonymus scale, which is one of the hard scales, and you guys can actually see it is pretty covered. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that because yes. I have euonymus scale at home. This is a major <laughs> pest. It is. And then we also have the white peach scale. And despite its name, the white peach scale does not occur just on peaches. This guy, mm. this is actually on laurel because wow. Yeah, laurel's in the peach family the peach. and the prunus. Right. We forget about that mm -hmm. one as well. But the reason they're difficult to control is the hard scale is actually feeding right on the outside of the phloem. So what right. insecticides we'd normally use to control are not gonna control, control it well. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of control, but not a lot. Okay. So that brings us to the next step on how to actually take care of those guys. All right. So I guess, in treatment, that is the difference. We have to use a systemic or can use a systemic with our soft scale, which would be something like a metoclopred, sure. dinotepheron. Mm -hmm. right. But as we know, again, relating back to our pollinators, there are specific times of the year that we do that right. and specific times we don't. We okay. do not use systemic neonicotinoids on flowering plants, um, the extended versions of those. There are some shorter lived products that have a much shorter shelf life, so we're out of the system of the plant by the time we have blooms. Good. But as for our hard scale, this is where it gets really crazy. It's tough. These guys, we actually have to attack at the juvenile stage. So scales, what most folks don't realize and why they are also very inconspicuous is they lose their legs once they start feeding and they blend into the plant. So they camouflage well. So they really ah. do camouflage. Yeah. That just kind of explains again, it's really, it's really hard. difficult. So these guys, because they're not feeding right in the phloem, that insecticide might get them just a little bit if we use a systemic, but it won't get good total control. And we want control of the hard scale because unlike soft scale, it can produce multiple generations a year, dependent on the weather. Now what's the weather like here? Hot. There we go. We have high temperatures, yes. humidity. That's perfect, perfect breeding ground for these folks. Perfect. Now, if we were up north, it wouldn't, you know, probably one generation, it's going to yeah. freeze it out, but not here. Yeah, you run on a scale here in the Memphis it's area. Crazy. We're looking at three generations. Three. Three right. minimum is yeah. usually what they say. Mm -hmm. But what we normally do with this, I tell people, 
Let's start in the spring really early, get some nice double-sided sticky tape, and hmm. we're gonna trap those crawlers. Huh. When they begin to hatch in the spring okay. is how you control hard scale. Right. We hit the crawlers with an oil spray. Mm -hmm. We can actually use a juvenile retardant spray, a growth regulator, something like okay. Talus. Uh -huh. um, but the other thing that we can do is actually prune them off when we have a lot of tissue that's infected. Which is what so, I do. Yes, right. that mm -hmm. is usually the step with euonymus scale because they get so out of hand right. very, very quickly with our area here. Okay. Um, let's try to think about the other differences. I guess one of the differences, now we do have some nice samples here of these, these very infested hard scale plants, <laughs> but one other difference, hard scale is much smaller than the soft scale. Okay. It's much more inconspicuous. Soft scale often will look like, I've compared, uh, let's say, the Florida wax scale. When this guy actually develops on the branches, it looks like little wads of, wa of bubble gum. Okay, a different way to look mm -hmm. at that. Oak lacanium scale will layer itself on a branch of an oak, a willow oak or something, and it looks like little marbles yeah. laid on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the other big difference in our scale insects. Soft scale doesn't have armor. So All when right. you open that scale up, you're pulling the whole insect off of the plant. All right. Very likely, you may see some eggs under there. Sure you will. <laughs> but hard scale, it actually has an armor that lifts off. One of the other reasons it is so incredibly difficult to control. That armor is like a raincoat. It's no fair. No. Mm -mm. It's no fair. They are just built for success. It kind of seems to be what it is. Yeah. But I think also it's kind of one of those, uh, they take out the weakers. Mm. So these guys really don't build up a whole lot until we might have some other plant stressors. Sure. Okay. But. Wow. Lots. Lots. Now nice going, so going back to the soft scales mm -hmm. now, you talked about the honeydew. Yes. All right. What okay. About Let's talk about honeydew a little bit. What it produces or helps to produce. This is that stuff right here called sooty mold. Yes. Sooty mold, I always tell folks when they say, what? I say, <laughs> you know the cars you see driving around uh -huh. in the summertime the that uh -huh. are covered, uh -huh. the, just the tops just the and tops. maybe the, right. the trunk and the hood are black. Yes. But it's a silver car. That is sooty mold. Sooty mold. Yeah. That happens when you park under a tree mm -hmm. that has an, a sap sucker we'll call it, okay. infestation, and All that right. can include many of the bugs, specifically soft scale as well. Right. But what's happening is these guys are voracious feeders of sap. And we know that sap has carbohydrates and sugars in it. Right. And that's why we call it honeydew. honeydew. It's sweet and it's sticky. Mm -hmm. So these little fellows are feeding on sap and what their bodies cannot ingest comes it's out out. in the liquid form. As our friend David Cook in Davidson County says, what goes in liquid comes out liquid. What goes in <laughs> oh, solid God. comes out solid. Uh, yeah. This applies for insects as well. Right. So uh, I always like to tell people as well, if you've ever been walking under a tree and you get dripped on and it's not raining. And it's not raining. I said the same you've thing. You've been pooped on That's by right. a sap sucker. That's right. So <laughs> the next step on that. Now it's excellent, obviously, if we can recognize that honeydew and we see those shiny right. spots. But if we don't, we may begin to have what we call sooty mold. Sure begin to develop on this honeydew. So the honeydew is actually a great media, I guess we'll call it. It's sticky, so these sticky. mold spores that are just blowing around in the air, normal, not pathogenic mm. to plants, not really pathogenic to us, they're able to stick to this honeydew because the honeydew is sweet, it sporulates, and is able to grow. It's a food source right there and it sticks to it. Honeydew. Honeydew brings on sooty Sooty's mold. Sooty mold ruins fences, cars, and patios. And so patios. we can actually stop this by recognizing that one thing. Good stuff, Amy. Yeah. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Honeydew. Honeydew. Sooty mold. It is not the honeydew list. Yeah, it's not the honeydew <laughs> list. No, it's the bad honeydew. one. All right. Thanks, Amy. You Good got stuff. it. All right. This is the golden rain tree that we rescued from a nursery about four years ago and we got it planted in the ground. At that time it was in a small one gallon container so the roots are really confined inside that, that plastic container. 
And here I am four years later taking a look at this tree, giving it a good inspection. And I've noticed that it's got some new growth right here that I'll explain in a minute. Got a little dieback on this side right here. The explanation for this is down low, we have a wound here and you can kind of follow the wound up the tree to somewhere in here and then going up on this side there's some fissures right here and on up higher we got some bark missing right here and it looks like the branch got cracked so it looks like this tree took some high wind and it pushed it back and you can see as I bend it the places that it bends on the tree and up here it looks like it just pushed it real hard and cracked that vascular tissue now, do we want to do any pruning on this tree because of that? No, not at this point. We're going to let the tree do what it, it, it's going to do. We may lose this part right up here at the top, but if we do that, at that point, we'll do some pruning. Here, you'll see this small, what we call epicormic growth, water sprouts. That is in response to, number one, this pruning cut that we made four years ago, and probably where another area where this tree bent in that high wind. And so it's responding to protect itself from that wound uh, decaying by pushing out this growth from a dormant or epicormic bud. So it's going to, this wants to produce energy in this section of the tree to make these cracks from the wind close over faster. So it's going to produce a lot of energy right here. That's why we don't want to cut these branches off. Also, by leaving these lower branches as long as you can possibly t stand it, it's going to help this tree grow in girth instead of trying to grow up high and tall and skinny like the trees in the forest do. And I think in the future, we're gonna end up with a happy, healthy golden rain tree. All right, here's our Q&A segment. We're actually ready, we have some great questions here. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, here's our first viewer email. What kind of tree is this? Hemlock was a guess. Most limbs are dying or dead. We have trimmed most of the dead limbs, but more are dying. What can we do? And this is Bunny in Clarksville, Tennessee. So let's go back. Okay. Is it a hemlock? She thinks it's a hemlock. Mm, Just by think? the picture that she sent, Miss Bunny, it looks like it's a blue spruce okay. or Colorado spruce. Uh -huh. yeah. And I'm with you. It, it's not unusual to see the spruce do this. They, they get the rhizosphera needle cast. Okay. That's the most common. And the tips will start dying out from the bottom and work its way up. Right. If your tree is under stress, Number one, they're a northern tree. Oh, I say, so it's, it's under really, stress. Right. It's, it's going to reach some, some point of stress in its yes. life because we're in Tennessee. Yes, definitely stressed. Uh, the other one would be Cytospora canker. That's most prevalent under trees, the, your spruce trees that are stressed. Okay. So it could be either one of those. Either one you can treat with the fungicide, um, keep your trees fertilized. I don't know that. That's what know, I was going to mention. I yeah. would say use a lower nitrogen fertilizer. Mm -hmm because uh, nitrogen can um, make fungus growth, at least it does in yards, um, grow faster. So, but use a copper fungicide, uh, do, do a little homework. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it, uh, rises uh, as far as uh, needle cast is probably your most common problem with the blue spruce. Definitely thought that, but I definitely, yeah, fertilize, of course, was something that I thought about. And something else, too. Uh, you want to keep the tree vigorous. You want to keep the tree vigorous. You want to keep it as comfortable, as happy as possible. And then here's the third thing for me. If you want somebody to come look at that, how about a certified opera? Call your, or the local UT extension there. In, there you go. In uh, Clarksville. That's right. Yeah, call the extension office there. Mm -hmm. Have them come out and take a look. Yeah. You know, or, or, you know, you can always go the, the next route, which is to call a certified arbor. Call a certified arborist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I think that would work. So there you have Miss Bunny. And I just so happened to know the agent there. So she would oh, be yes, definitely uh, happy to help you out there in Clarksville, uh, Tennessee. All right, so here's our next Veer email. This unusual leaf is on a very large magnolia. I have only seen it once before several years ago on the same tree in about the same place on the tree. Thanks, this is Lee here in Memphis, Tennessee. So it is an unusual leaf. And you and I are kind of going <laughs> back and forth. I, you know, I think it's a fused leaf, you yeah. know, which I think is probably just a natural occurrence, maybe a natural phenomenon, but. It kind of, it almost looks like it's a fused leaf, but I would, I won't, I, this confused me a lot. I've never seen this in my yeah, 37 I, year I, career. I've never seen it either. Never. And I actually sent this picture to uh, my friend who's a, uh, more of a, uh, the fungus type person at okay. the Morton Arboretum. Uh, she is a professor. Okay, okay. And she's only seen it happen in spores of fungus. Mm. And so this 
brought up some interest to me. And I found some interesting facts by Dr. Maxwell Masters that he published in 1862. Wow. Yeah. You can see how deep I got into this. I was really interested. All right. Uh, it's either auxiliary, auxiliary or median prolification. Wow. Or prolification. Basically, the leaf, the leaf reproduced itself. Okay. okay. This happens commonly in like bell peppers, where you can cut open a bell pepper, and you'll have another smaller bell pepper that exactly. grew inside of it. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's basically it's producing without fertilization or seed. So it just, it, in a uh, generic sense, it, it reproduced itself. Mm -hmm. It grew an extra thumb. It grew an, oh, <laughs> but you know what? But but it, it, you know it, it looks beautiful. You know, so I would just keep it. I wouldn't worry so much about it, right? I, no, don't yeah, worry about it at I don't all. Worry about that. What interests me, this yeah. about me is what I would love to see the growing site to see what contributes to that soil, to that, right? Or on that side of the tree, you know why? I, I want to know why. Right. Just just to have an answer, right, just, right. just for myself because it's most interesting. It is, like I said, I've seen many magnolia trees, uh, but I've never seen that before. I haven't either. Yeah, but I, but I think it's kind of cool, so I, yeah, I, I would keep it, so yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of deep research there. <laughs> it is, and uh, he's got some bragging rights there. <laughs> yeah, golly, so there you have it, Mr. Lee. Thank you for that. Uh, here's our next viewer email. This summer, I've noticed wood dust on our hickory tree. I've washed it away, and it reappears in a few days. It seems to be coming from up above, what could be causing this? And this is Mike from Ringgold, Georgia. Hickory trees, and of course, the first thing that came to my mind, maybe a boar, a some boar. type of boar. Yes, I don't see any exit holes on this yeah. picture here, but that fine sawdust is a little heavier than what carpenter ants would, ah, would make. Okay. So I would, going by this picture, in my experience, I would say that this tree is infested with ambrosia boars, ah, okay, okay. which there's three or four different types. Oh, yeah. uh, the granulated, I'm familiar Ambrosia with that borer one, yeah. will leave the toothpick type mm -hmm. sawdust that comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll attack newly transplanted trees, small trees, Japanese maples, cherry trees, and like that. So the tree does not have to be stressed. This type of ambrosia borer, and I'm going by species of tree too, hickory, uh, there's, there is some stress going on. The ambrosia borer that makes this much sawdust generally attacks trees that are either dying, diseased, or severely stressed. Oh, okay. When they get to when a tree gets to that point, it it emits a gas like a ethanol type gas that attracts the boars oh, to the tree wow. like this. So it brings more on. Oh, how about that? Lunch is served. Right. And so when these boars, the adults bore all through the vascular tissue of the tree, not only are they creating holes and separating that that vascular tissue, that xylem and phloem tissue, but they're creating like a fungal garden inside those tunnels. It's really interesting. And that fungus that they grow in those tunnels feeds the adults and the growing larvae gotcha. inside there. So gotcha. you have to act quick to hire a certified arborist to spray this tree with a permethrin type insecticide wow. and you need a spreader sticker to go mixed in with that, okay. that chemical so it stays on the tree and continues to control this beetle. If, 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 it's, if this ambrosia borer is not controlled, the tree will, would probably die. Probably eventually die. Wow. Yeah. How about that? And, and I guess, you know, spraying for that tree, you know, there's a, you know, there's a window, right? There, there is a window. You, you don't have very much yeah. time uh, with this. It, if you can picture taking and cutting that bark off that tree, so there's no nutrient flow, yeah. there's no sap flow. That, that's basically what's happening what, yeah. underneath the bark. Yeah. You're just cutting that tree in half, all that tissue. Wow. So no water and nutrients to the upper canopy. Mm -mm. Or the yeah. lower. It's, or lower. There's no transportation yeah. whatsoever. How about that? Yeah. All right, Mr. Mike. Yeah, you got your hands full with that one. Yeah. yeah. So I would uh, yeah, definitely call the certified operators to see if he can help out with that for sure. All right, here's our next viewer email. I like to cut the berries from five sumac trees in my backyard, but they are getting too tall. I've heard that I can prune them right down to ground level and they will regrow. Should I do this late winter or early spring while dormant? Will this work? This is Dee from Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. So she wants to cut down the five sumac trees. She likes the berries. Yeah. So I, when is I, the best time to do that? I want to talk about these berries here in a minute, Hots? too. Okay, okay. I would cut these down when it gets cold. Okay. Yeah, and, and let them, uh, the nutrients drop down from the canopy down into the root system. And then when you cut them at the ground, it'll have more energy stored 
to shoot up new growth. Right. Right. And then manage the canopy as they get older. I've, I've done this before. Okay. Good, good. Uh, manage the canopy and don't allow them to get tall. So bring them back down to a lateral after they bloom. You know, and just work on keeping them short instead of letting them get too tall. Okay, let's do this in the winter time, though, Mr. Yes, right. winter time. Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about those berries. The unique thing about the when when you read that the, these were in New York, right. I met. You, you know, we risk being in the tree business for so many years. Mm -hmm. You know, we run across a lot of wild beehives, and so instead of just cutting them and leaving them on the ground or something, we would call beekeepers to come out and collect the, the honeybees that we've removed from the tree. Okay. Um, the sumac in New York is what he put in his smoker ah. to create the smoke to distract the bees and to collect the, the, the queen. Huh. So that's what was really unique about the sumac from New York. I've tried to use oh, the sumac the flowers that we have down here and it just didn't work the same. I don't know what the difference is, but uh, that's the unique thing about those berries. Never knew that before. That's yeah. good. Now, one other thing about cutting on the sumac. The sumac is in the cashew family, okay. Okay. which includes mangoes and poison yeah. ivy. Yes, ivy. And yeah. so that sap is milky, and if it gets on you- It can irritate it, your skin. It could, and it's mm -hmm. gonna, it may, it may, I'm not saying that it will, but mm -hmm. it may uh, treat you just like poison ivy would. Okay. So be cautious, wear your gloves and long sleeves. Be careful, D. Yeah, be yeah. careful with that, that's for sure. Good stuff about the berries. Didn't know that before. Yeah, interesting. it's interesting. Interesting. How about that? We found out some interesting stuff here today. Yep. All right, here's our next viewer email. Another interesting question. I planted a sweet cherry fruit tree last spring, and I have noticed an issue with leaf curling. This year in early spring, the cherry tree looked healthy and even flowered without any issues. About mid-April, almost all of the leaves started to curl and develop brown areas. Some turned yellow and fell off the tree. Yeah. I looked up some of the fungal diseases and I do not see any signs of spores on the undersides of the leaves. I also have not seen any aphids. What do you think the issue could be? And this is Carson from Vancouver, British Columbia. So he did his homework. He, he did actually his went homework. out to look, mm -hmm. you know, uh, didn't see, uh, you know, some of the fungal diseases that he looked up and he noticed he didn't see any aphids. So I give him credit for going out there, you know. It, doing his homework, inspecting. Even though, I do too, and I yeah. really appreciate that oh, yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, it shows that he really cares. Mm -hmm. um, I would, at any, whatever you call it, it's still gonna be scorch. Okay. It's not bacterial, but chances are, more than likely, I would say more than 75% that he has cherry leaf scorch. Okay. And uh, look up what types of fungicides that you use in your area. Uh, read and follow the label on those fungicides the label. for the scorch, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and uh, and that's the best advice I could give you. And also, I would fertilize this tree in, in the late fall. Okay. Whatever late fall falls into your yeah. area that you're yeah, in. Yeah, British Columbia, right? Yeah. yeah. But I would say this too, yeah, make sure you practice good sanitation. You want to get those leaves up because some of those leaves will have fungal spores, of course. That too. So you yeah. want so to you make want to sure that. you pick up your leaves and dispose of them in the trash because yes, when it rains, or you use your irrigation, it'll never go away because when right. it, the water hits those wet leaves, the spores just fly back up in the air. That's right. And reattack the plant. All right. Now, I, I thought about the fire blight on, on this. You know, that was another disease that I looked at with the cherry trees and any of your fruit bearing trees. Right. Definitely the fruit bearing trees. Uh, but this is not fire blight. No, I didn't think it was fire no. blight. Fire blight will have that distinct shepherd's hook on the yeah. stems where it crumps over and, and the leaves don't fall off. Yeah. Yeah, that is something about fire, right? The leaves mm -hmm. don't fall off. Yeah. That there's no abscission. Yeah. All right, Carson. Hope that helps you out. And yeah, in your area, contact the certified arborist too. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have a cluster of crepe myrtles that are about 75 years old. They are roughly 15 feet tall. I have thinned them several times. This year, the tops of some of them are dying. I don't see any fungus or any diseases. Could this be the end of their lifespan? And this is Joe, Carrierville, Tennessee. This is a question we've gotten constantly. All year. All year. Yeah. Yeah. About the crepe myrtles. Joe, I right. uh, think your crepe myrtles <laughs> still have a chance. They got a chance. But the tips, with a lot of tip dieback from a late freeze, late to, or freeze. actually it was an early freeze, yeah. we had in yeah. November. November, All right. Yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah. anybody that has a crepe myrtle, uh, you're going to see this. You can drive it. in Germantown, you can drive up and down Wolf River Boulevard Cordoba. where we have lots of crepe myrtles sure. and the tops are dying back. Mm -hmm. 
I'm the city arborist for Germantown, uh, National Resource go. Manager, so I'm go. being patient. And Joe, I'm trying to com communicate this with you on what I would do. I'm being patient. If I have the opportunity to prune some of them, uh, the dead out, I'm going to do that. If not, I'm just going to wait until that new growth comes out, and then next year I'll probably prune. I'm dealing with the ugly right now, though. Okay. There was one crepe myrtle that we had on Forest Hill Irene. It was really, really hit hard, and it was a big one. It was a, probably 20 inches in full diameter. Okay. Good size. And so what I had asked Public Works to do in Germantown was just cut it to the ground, and you know crepe myrtles, they'll, they'll spring back. Okay, so right, I'm going right. to let this crepe myrtle cop us back out, meaning okay. that the sprouts are going to come off the trunk that I cut. And then at that point, I got me a brand new crepe myrtle, and I'm going to manage the stems that I want to keep. Select those stems that you want to keep. Yep. Because you know what's right in front of that crepe myrtle I cut down? So welcome to Germantown sign. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I don't need an ugly crepe myrtle at the welcome to Germantown right, sign. Right. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I, I definitely understand. We're starting but yeah, over. But that's the problem. Yeah. If you remember back in November, we had warm temperatures and all of a sudden the bottom fell out. Yeah. And yeah. And those trees just didn't have a chance to harden out. They did not. Mm -hmm. yeah, harden off. You know, yeah. So yeah, that was the problem. And then of course, you, you know, I think it was back in March or April, there was another, you know, there was another mm -hmm. frost and yeah, yeah, it just, yeah, it did a lot of damage. Just something we have to do with. Patience. Yeah. Right? Patience. Prune out what you can, be patient. Thank you for that question, Joe. All right, Wes. So it's been good. A lot of great questions. Always do your homework, right? Do your homework. Know your trees. Know your trees. Always a lot to learn, right? Yes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. Have a question about your garden? Drop us a line. Go to familyplotgarden.com and click on the Ask Us Your Gardening Question banner. Your question might just end up right here on the show. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.